I have done psychedelics. Less now, but once, a lot. Yeah, I have exactly zero experience using psychedelics. Reality is uh, distorted somewhat, and uh, there's a lot of laughing. Psychedelic drugs have impacted humanity for as long as there have been people who want to get their minds blown. There has been hardly any society that hasn't used some kind of psychoactive substance. It's been used ritualistically, it has been used therapeutically. They can cause shifts in perspective that can be terrifying or revolutionary. I definitely think psychedelics played a role in changing the status quo. Women went from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, gay people from the closet to the altar. The one ingredient in the recipe of social transformation and change is that millions of us lay prostrate before the gates of awe, having taken a psychedelic. These substances are so powerful that the tiniest amount can make a big difference. 250 micrograms. 250. Like, let's say you take 350 micrograms, then what happens? 250. 250 micrograms, that's going to change everything. Such a tiny amount can change not only the way we see the world, but change the world itself. This is a psychedelic history with trippy numbers that are groovy, man. Let's begin at the beginning and start with the number one. Psychedelics like magic mushrooms and LSD are a class of drug that alter the user's consciousness. They can cause hallucinations and ecstatic feelings of communion. Psychedelics are popular now because they help us have experiences and thoughts beyond what is considered common or normally acceptable. And People often really enjoy those experiences. Or they can cause fear, paranoia, and confusion. Oh, uh, bad trips are really bad. The hallucinations take over, paranoia sets in, and a person dissolves into the experience and are essentially assaulted by the images, sounds, and hallucinations. Which is why, according to the US Drug Enforcement Agency, psychedelics are a controlled substance and a Schedule I drug. <laughs> but if you're not a government agency, being number one is sometimes the whole point. Take Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is the entrepreneur and co-founder of Apple Computer. Before that, he was a hippie. We started Apple because we wanted the product ourselves. Jobs said that using psychedelics was a profound and positive life-changing experience. But I don't think it's because of the experience of LSD that Jobs was created. What I think happened was that people like Jobs rewrote the meaning of computers, turned them from tools of Cold War industry into tools of personal exploration. At the same time, turning Apple into the number one company in the world. A lot of people that I know doing psychedelics are not inventing any iPhones or iPads. The iPhone is the ultimate toy for somebody who's high. Drug use is fantastic for ideation. It's not great for actually working on things and implementing them and being functional. Admittedly, Steve Jobs was one in a million, or perhaps one in 32 million. 10% of the adult population in the United States has used psychedelic drugs at least once. That's 32 million people. It's a psychedelic renaissance. And surprisingly, it puts the 1960s to shame. Today's millennial might not look like yesterday's hippie, but if you're in your 30s, you are 10 times more likely to use psychedelics than the flower power generation was. Groovy. LSD, the psychedelic of the hippie generation, was discovered as a result of 25 trials and one tiny error. It's 1943 in Basel, Switzerland. Albert Hoffman is doing medical research. Yeah, pretty interesting. And he is just about to accidentally kick off the modern psychedelic era. Hoffman, from a young age, was a mental explorer. He was very spiritual. Uh, his friends were surprised when he decided to become a chemist. 
1943, working on ergot, this curious fungal parasite. Hoffman had made on a whim the 25th of a series of indole alkaloids when suddenly he got dizzy. A tiny trace has found its way onto his skin, as little as 20 millionths of a gram. Uh, as he put it, he felt quite sick, but not unpleasantly. Hoffman's scientific curiosity is aroused by this one tiny mistake. And on April 19th, he ingests a higher dose, 250 micrograms, then decides to head home. He was riding his bike back at home, and he ended up going on the most momentous bicycle ride in history because the substance was LSD-25. He went on the world's first acid trip. Can you imagine riding home on your bicycle, um, hallucinating, seeing, you know, purple rings around the lights, seeing the traffic going by and making, making strange synesthetic sounds? I don't know whether it would have been terrifying, delightful, or both. He was watching the road one minute, and in the next second, the whole thing turns into an episode of The Simpsons. Um, if I'm tripping balls, I don't want to be operating any sort of a vehicle. I can't even operate this vehicle uh, by putting one foot in front of the other. He made it home safe. That's all that mattered. This is an electrifying experience for Hoffman, who believes he has discovered a sacred drug, a drug so powerful that this magic bike ride is fueled by an absolutely teeny weeny dose. 250 micrograms is 10 times lighter than a human hair. 250 micrograms is a pretty small amount, but it can have a massive impact. Neurotransmitters are already relatively small molecules, so it wouldn't take a whole lot of lysergic acid to completely reorient the way you see the world. So what exactly does this minuscule dose do to Hoffman on his famous bike ride? shuts down parts of your prefrontal cortex. So those parts of yourself that associate your identity with how you look, how you dress, what you're capable of, all those regions go offline. You're no longer so associated with your identity that you can only see your existence through your lens at that time. Hoffman presents his LSD findings to Sandoz, the pharmaceutical firm he's working for. But they consider it of no practical use and shelve it. 10 years later, Hoffman's moldering joy drug will be dusted off by the unlikeliest of customers. It's the 1950s, and agricultural scientist Sidney Gottlieb is living in a rural cabin without any running water when he's recruited by the CIA in the fight against communism. We are trying to invent faster than them. We're trying to invent more destructive devices than them. We're trying to impact politically more countries than they are. So it's literally a two country fight for world domination. We were locked in a Cold War and American state officials were terrified that there were these secret communist forces slipping into our society. Do you have any evidence of any kind to indicate that there's any subversive amongst these young men? The U.S. has a stockpile of around 1,000 nuclear warheads. But that's not nearly enough weapons for the CIA, which wants 1,000 times more. And Gottlieb is the man to get them. The CIA taps him to come in and research potential poisons for uh, warfare uses. And Gottlieb ends up getting the nickname the Black Sorcerer. The Sorcerer's on the case. Gottlieb thinks way, way outside the box. Later in his career, he will try to take down Fidel Castro. Ah, vive la revolution. And he's not above using slapstick comedy to do it. Ouch. He attempts to kill Castro with a poisonous cigar. <laughs> an exploding conch shell, and a pair of radioactive shoes designed to make Fidel Castro's beard drop out. The US was really desperate to find any kind of weapon that would allow them to one-up the Russians, whether that's a warhead or some sort of chemical weapon. When Gottlieb hears about LSD from an operative in Switzerland, Hello. 
he spies a one in a million opportunity. The CIA, one of the things they were looking for was some sort of truth serum, and they were hoping that LSD would provide that. Gottlieb wants to corner the market before the Soviets can get to this powerful new drug. So he agrees to pay $240,000 for what he believes is the world's entire supply, 100 million doses. He not only keeps the drug out of the hands of the Russians, but he also becomes the unwitting drug mule who brings LSD to the States. There were already rumors of Chinese mind control being experimented on American soldiers during the Korean War. Then there'd been talk of brainwashing. Wasn't brainwashing a big thing with the Chinese? In 1953, the CIA appoints Gottlieb as head of Project MK Ultra, a program that will test drugs like LSD on unsuspecting members of the American public. Gottlieb will head MK Ultra for 20 years. That's a long time. In that time, he will oversee 149 mind control experiments. More than 25 of these experiments involve administering LSD to thousands of non-consenting victims. One test subject was given LSD for 174 consecutive days. But much of MK Ultra's research is carried out in broad daylight. The subjects of MK Ultra with which I'm most familiar were college students and young people here in Northern California, administered as a standard drug trial, just as any other drug trial would have been. For all the time and effort, the extensive MK Ultra experiments fail to produce any practical applications. I really don't think LSD would make a great truth serum. You're still capable of lying on acid. <laughs> like... They gave acid to Ted Kaczynski, a brilliant mathematics student at Harvard, and then subjected him to a traumatic experience. Guess what gave the world the Unabomber? It's like, that's so inconsiderate. I don't know what type of truth you're gonna get. It might be somebody's own truth, which is, I am a tree. I don't think LSD worked as a truth theorem at all. I don't see any evidence for that. I think more recently, LSD has been shown to offer a sense of interconnection. But MKUltra was not looking to help people feel more peaceful and happy with one another. MKUltra was looking to, to, to stave off communism. The CIA's truth theorem has zero success. But it will prove to be a game changer, thanks to 14 tie-dye t-shirts. The CIA's MK Ultra program had some unintended consequences. They were trying to root out subversive elements in America, but for many of the participants of the experiments, LSD opened their eyes to a new way of seeing the world. The CIA gave the gift of LSD to the 1960s, creating a whole new class of subversive weirdos. Beat poet Allen Ginsberg and Grateful Dead lyricist Robert Hunter had their first experiences with LSD in these experiments. This is a program designed to produce a truth serum, but it ends up energizing the counterculture. In the late 1950s, Ken Kesey is a young writer who is working in a psychiatric ward and volunteering in drug trials to make some extra money. Ken Kesey was in the process of writing One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and he participated in the MKUltra studies in 1959. He said he suddenly cracked open and became a different kind of person. He forms a group of 14 psychedelic adventurers called the Merry Pranksters and fits them out with a vehicle designed to travel into the cosmic heart of America. Imagine, if you would, the same school bus that picked you up every day as you went to school, covered in swirling pinks and greens and yellows. On the front, they paint their destination. Further. This becomes the name of the bus, as well as a mission statement for the Merry Pranksters. They become kind of 1960s Instagram influencers, going around and putting on artistic shows, sharing LSD with people, and living hashtag van life the kind of free artist lifestyle that is very aspirational today. They drive from California to New York, a 12-day hallucinogenic odyssey. When the bus swerves off an Arizona highway into a swamp, they pour paint into the water and dip their clothes 
inventing the classic uniform of the 1960s. Love the colors. The tie-dye t-shirt. And when their antics attract the attention of the police, the ticket, baby. They skate away without consequences because in 1964, LSD is still completely legal. The merry pranksters create the template for the hippie movement. Freedom, spontaneity, and communion with art and nature. It's all an alternate universe that's unlocked with LSD, a substance that is still legal, but finding a source for the stuff is tricky. Alfie Stanley, or Fair, was famous for being the live mixing board operator for the Grateful Dead. But he was also the one that made the LSD that was given to dozens of musicians from the time period that we associate with psychedelics. Between 1965 and 1967, Owsley Stanley produces 500 grams of LSD, more than 5 million doses. He produces so much, in fact, that Owsley is added to the Oxford English Dictionary, meaning an extremely potent, high-quality form of LSD. But the 60s will be a decade split down the middle by the number 23. Owsley calls his acid white lightning, and Ken Kesey and the pranksters begin to distribute it at a series of 23 parties they call acid tests, multimedia events that celebrate LSD. You would have seen flickering lights. You would have heard the music of the Grateful Dead. You would have seen day glow paint. There's just an enormous dance party. And people are tripping, and they are forming a new kind of society connected by the sensation of shared consciousness. Tales of Kesey's acid tests spread like wildfire. LSD becomes a rite of passage for the baby boom generation. But the party suddenly stops on May 30th, 1966. Enter Donald L. Grunsky, Senator for California's 23rd District, whose bill will make LSD illegal in the state. Uh, bummer, man. But the genie isn't going back in the bottle. Legal or not, LSD is part of a cultural shift that's sweeping America. A shift that's defined by six simple words. It's January 14th, 1967. Timothy Leary is a 47-year-old psychologist who has been fired from Harvard for his work on LSD, and he's become a full-time evangelist for the drug. He is about to address 25,000 hippies who have gathered at San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. Many of them are naked. The human being was a festival in Golden Gate Park. People came from all over the city. They put flowers in their hair. A parachutist throws free doses of LSD to the crowd. The local chapter of the Hell's Angels, mellowed by LSD, are the security. They listen to music by Janis Joplin and the Jefferson Airplane. They hear Allen Ginsberg chanting Hare Krishna. The hippies are confronting the darkness in their country with love. Make love, not war. This is during the Vietnam War. This is in the wake of race riots that are occurring around the United States. The human being offers us a glimpse of a different America, an America that could be based around peacefulness. Timothy Leary takes the stage and utters six words that will define a generation. Turn on, tune in, drop out. Turn on, take LSD. Tune in to the secret system of vibrations and currents that LSD revealed and drop out of mainstream bureaucratic society. And he thought that if they did, society as a whole would change. We would have a new America. You know, telling kids to, to just tune in, turn it, and drop out seems pretty negative, especially from a teacher. Never encourage my students to drop out. I'm going to pass on to my psychedelic co-religionists the lessons that we have learned over the last six years. I think many young people, even today, connect with the phrase, turn on, tune in, and drop out, because it suggests a spiritual connection between us and the larger universe. The Human Being was the dress rehearsal for Woodstock, a three-day music festival in upstate New York that includes a tent to help people navigating bad trips. 400,000 people showing up in the same place 
to share an experience, to receive a message, and to commune with one another. But what the hippie generation doesn't realize is that they're late for their own party. Approximately 9,000 years late. In 1955, Gordon Wasson is a banker, but more importantly, he's a mycophile, a mushroom lover. Mm. And he'll be one of the first Americans to discover there is more than one way of getting high, more like 200 ways, sprouting up all over the planet. But he wouldn't have found out if it had not been for the number 58. It's important to remember that whereas the era of Timothy Leary led to the complete popularization of these substances, up until 1960, those who studied these plants were a really remarkable, eclectic handful of scholars. Gordon Wasson has a theory that there are cultures who use mushrooms for their religion. Hmm, I wonder. So when he learns from a pen pal that the people in Oaxaca have a mushroom they call Teowanacatl, God's flesh, he gets there as fast as he can. The Mazatec people were not the only indigenous group that used psilocybin, but it was the one that he found. Hola. Wasson meets a woman named Maria Sabina who knows about Teowanacatl. Maria Sabina was a traditional Mazatec healer. In many ways, she was just uh, one among other healers. She was very humble, poor, uh, local woman. Gordon Wasson pretends to be sick and persuades Maria to let him attend one of her all-night veladas, or healing ceremonies. He is the first outsider to ingest this mushroom in a sacred context, and he photographs it. He wrote it up for Life magazine, an editor picked a snappy title, Seeking the Magic Mushrooms. Timothy Leary had a subscription. He made his own beeline to Cuernavaca. The psychedelic gold rush was on. Suddenly, the whole world knows that if you want magic mushrooms, Maria Sabina is the woman to see. Maria Sabina got to be really famous, but she also experienced the cruelties of that fame. Maria's village is overrun with hippies, scientists, and all kinds of scumbag who just want to get high. Hey, you know to, score some shrooms? to the police, she's a drug dealer. Her house was burned. There was a lot of tragic episodes in her life. Maria's life is shattered by the attention from the outside world. Wasson, on the other hand, had a terrific Mexican adventure paid for, as it turns out, by the CIA as MK Ultra's subproject 58. When he was done, he sent samples of the mushrooms to his pal, Albert Hoffman. You see, it's all connected, man. From that point forward, uh, Americans became fascinated by mushrooms. You don't have to synthesize them in a laboratory like LSD or MDMA. You can just go in a field, pick them, dry them, and eat them. No one knows how many species of mushroom there are, though it's estimated there may be as many as 3.8 million. Of these, more than 200 are psilocybin mushrooms. Psilocybin is the magic part of magic mushrooms, the chemical that causes psychedelic effects. Psilocybin mushrooms grow across six continents. There aren't any mushrooms on Antarctica. Mexico is the global hotspot, home to 53 species of magic mushrooms. Do mushrooms count? Oh, then I have been high on psychedelics. I like shrooms more, if we're gonna be talking about drugs. Uh, it's like acid with a seatbelt, so it's nice. We don't realize that in order to find out what you can eat, that people literally had to try things and make people aware that this is something you wanna stay away from, or hey, this mushroom right here, it's nourishing, and it gives you an interesting perspective on life. And as we're discovering, people have been getting an interesting perspective on life for the last 9,000 years. Probably our very earliest evidence that people were using mushrooms for reasons other than the food is from the site of Tosili, Niger in Algeria. We have a depiction of a humanoid figure who has a bee or insect's face, but they're also surrounded by an aura of mushrooms, which suggests to us that this is about a religious experience. People have been finding different ways to alter their minds for a long, long time. And it's not just mushrooms. They've been using flowers, cacti, vines, and even toads. 
Of the 120 or so recognized hallucinogens, several of which are, are questionable, fully 90% of them are from the American hemisphere. It turns out Albert Hoffman and Gordon Wasson, not to mention Sidney Gottlieb, weren't discovering anything new. Which begs the question, why did it take the West so long to catch on when psychedelics can be found almost everywhere? One answer can be found hiding somewhere in the number 548. For many cultures, psychedelics aren't drugs. They're religious or ritual sacraments. The use of psychedelics particularly has been really influential for indigenous peoples across the Americas, but not only in Americas, all over the planet. Indigenous people have used these substances for thousands of years and having no drug abuse problems. How do they do it? Well, first they recognize that the use of these substances is a legitimate thing to do. They use their plants in natural form, which is pharmacologically the safest. And critically, they envelop the user in a protective cloak of ritual that insulates him or her from the sometimes dazzling psychological and psychic power of these substances. And so that's the path we should follow, the path of the shaman. Standing at just half an inch high, the psilocybe Mexicana magic mushroom packs a psychedelic punch. By contrast, the Amazonian psychedelic vine, Banisteriopsis capi, is 2,352 times bigger at 98 feet long. But as explorer Manuel Villavicencio finds out, size doesn't matter. It's all about how you brew it. In the 1850s, Manuel Villavicencio is following the path of the shaman across Ecuador, and in the remote eastern part of the country, he becomes immersed in the traditions of the Havaro people. He studied the Hivaru. The Hivaru were famous and a little bit exoticized for the practice of shrinking heads and things like that. Manuel Villavicencio watches as the Avaro shaman brews a drink from the bark of a giant vine boiled for 12 hours. By firelight, the shaman drinks and hands it to Villavicencio. He takes a swig and suddenly he's swimming. Where is he flying? Fantastic birds glide by and speak to him. Hey, man. And then he plunges to earth to be consumed by unimaginable horrors. Manuel Villavicencio has taken ayahuasca, one of the most potent hallucinogens on the planet. Ayahuasca is a very traditional sacred plant of the Amazon that has been used by more than 70 indigenous groups. Ayahuasca means vine of the soul. The people of the actual Northwest Amazon say you're sucking at the breast of Jaguar woman when she tears you from her kit and throws you in a pit of vipers. It's about getting to the other side. Villa Vicencio writes one of the first accounts of ayahuasca in his book, Geografia de la Republica del Ecuador. It was only published in Spanish, so it didn't get a lot of visibility. It's one of the most powerful psychedelics known to humankind, but Villa Vicencio's obscure geography textbook is no bestseller, and the secret of ayahuasca will lie hidden somewhere inside its 548 pages for 100 years. But if ayahuasca was one of the best-kept psychedelic secrets of the last century, it isn't anymore. Today, living in the Bay Area, the Uber driver knows about ayahuasca, the person in Whole Food knows about ayahuasca. But for rookie Westerners, this is not a substance that should be taken lightly. The few people that I know who've tried ayahuasca describe it as physically really rough. It makes you very nauseous and you vomit. Traditionally, it's considered some kind of purging substance, like having a medicine that cleans you up. And then you have a series of hallucinations that are very much a kind of religious experience, almost a kind of psychosis. It's a psychosis best explained by the number 13. Ayahuasca's powerful effects can be attributed to its main active ingredient, dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, a chemical in the brain associated with near-death experiences. People often describe leaving the experience as a feeling reborn. And so to be reborn, one must die in a, in a spiritual sense. 
And this is a common description that we see even in people recently who've tried ayahuasca. At the end of the day, we're talking about the great mysteries of life. And we still have a lot of existential questions. In a recent scientific study, out of 13 volunteers given DMT, all 13 have out-of-body experiences. Hey, has anybody seen my body? 66% report meeting aliens, robots, or elves during their trip. Oh, not the probe again. And 80% reported their experiences under the influence are more real than their waking lives. Whether you're talking about the Siberian shaman who travel through the trees and go up into the spirit world, or whether you're talking about the Peruvian shamans who do the same with the vine of the soul, ayahuasca, there is the sense of traveling through some sort of spirit world that cuts across psychedelic rituals across the planet. But indigenous peoples are not the only ones who've had their culture shaped by psychedelics. It turns out, so is the West. If you've ever counted how many days till Christmas, you've been waiting for one of the patron saints of psychedelia. There is speculation that Santa Claus was a mushroom, Amanita mascara, because it is a red and white buttoned mushroom. He goes on a trip across the sky with flying reindeer, a species that also incidentally loves to eat mushrooms, especially Amanita muscaria mushrooms. A dude's gonna come into your home and not steal your things, but he'll give you things, you know? Like, all he asks is milk. You have all sorts of characters dealing drugs. You got Santa Claus, apparently, leprechauns, uh, my old college roommates. But Santa isn't the only trace of psychedelics in Western culture. One of the active ingredients in LSD is nothing new. It's called ergot, a fungal parasite that develops on crops such as oats, rye, barley, and rice. Hoffman thought he was the first to go on the trip of a lifetime. It turns out he was more like the six million. Let's rewind two and a half thousand years to ancient Greece. Socrates, yes, that Socrates, was one of six million men who were inducted into a secret society known as the Eleusinian Mysteries, a multi-day ritual with a psychedelic conclusion. We know that people were pilgrimaging for multiple days, praying, chanting in these large groups, and at the very end, taking a drink that caused them to have experiences that were incredible. But we don't know what exactly the elixir they take at the end to hallucinate was. This elixir was called Kikion, and no one knows what the active ingredient was, but psychedelic scholar Gordon Wasson, remember him? He had a theory. He suggested that was in fact psychoactive and that it was based on Ergot, which of course years later Albert Hoffman would be working with when he discovered LSD. Ancient Greece was not the first or last culture in the West to tangle with Ergot, which has proved to be both a blessing and a curse to humanity. Remember the adage of Paracelsus that the difference between a poison, a drug, a hallucinogen, and a narcotic is just dosage. In the Middle Ages, Ergot was both a poison and a drug. Midwives used it to aid childbirth, but a tainted loaf of rye bread could cause temporary madness or worse. Ergot, this curious fungal parasite that caused St. Anthony's fire when entire medieval towns would go crazy and fingers would go necrotic and noses would fall off. Lots of people in medieval Europe and in the Americas understood not to eat ergot and to remove it from the rye, but sometimes people didn't know and it can decimate a village. What is a hallucinogen? What is a poison? I mean, the key thing is whether or not a culture is able to use a plant substance in helpful ways. How can you tell the difference between psychedelic good and psychedelic bad? In 17th century New England, the number 24 will show just how bad it can get. It's 1692 and nine-year-old Betty Paris is not feeling well. After she and her friends dabble in fortune-telling, she develops a fever. 
but soon she is hiding under furniture. <laughs> then she barks like a dog. She has uncontrollable screaming fits, and then the condition spreads to her friends. We're talking about a very restricted conservative society. Any sort of strange behavior, especially on the part of young girls, would have been viewed as heresy. The local minister believes she's bewitched, and it will end badly in the Salem Witch Trials. I remember watching Salem Witch Trial movies when I was in junior high school, and it was just put forward that these witches had gone crazy. Uh, more recently, there is speculation that they might have been eating tainted bread with ergot. What she was experiencing may have been in her mind, or it may have been LSD. We have many examples in the past of ergotism impacting entire communities. And even fairly recently in the 1950s, it occurred in France in 2001 in Ethiopia. This is not something relegated to the past. During the Salem witch trials, over 200 people are accused of witchcraft. 30 are found guilty. 19 are hanged. Four die in prison. And one is crushed to death under stones. That's a total of 24 deaths and countless ruined lives. Betty Paris was lucky. She survived the witch hunts. But 300 years later, a new kind of witch hunt is taking place. Remember Woodstock in the summer of 1969? Well, 400,000 partygoers are about to come up against the power of the number one. LSD and the hope for society based on benevolent shared consciousness is bumping up against the reality of our crimes in the Vietnam War and the race riots and the racial tension here at home. And it, it becomes clear that LSD can't fix that stuff. What's more, LSD starts to look like a source of crime. At the same time as Woodstock, a gruesome mass murder in Hollywood shocks America. These seven murders were committed by a gang of hippie thugs known as the Manson family. Charles Manson is said to have used LSD to control his followers and reshape their sense of morality and reality. When it came to the Manson trial, that was everything the government needed. People take this, they commit acts like this. And that was extremely powerful anti-LSD advertisement right there. There was a lot of hysteria about people painting LSD on doorknobs or putting it in Halloween candy. There was never any documented evidence of this occurring, but this really scares a lot of Americans. LSD has already been classified as a Schedule I controlled substance, the same legal category as heroin. I am glad that in this administration, we have increased the amount of money for handling the problem of dangerous drugs sevenfold. In 1971, President Richard Nixon goes further and declares drugs to be public enemy number one, putting psychedelics squarely in US law enforcement's crosshairs. Then in the 1980s, Nancy Reagan spearheads the war on drugs with her Just Say No campaign. It's never been because the drug is bad for you. It's always been a way to target the community using it. You have marijuana in the early 1900s, which targeted Mexican laborers. Uh, then you have the criminalization of cocaine, which was targeting the African-American community. Prohibition is about 100 years old, and it's, it's a kind of anomaly in the history of humankind. If you look in the bigger picture, the war on drugs has gone on now for 50 years. It's cost a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars is a stack of dollar bills that would reach a quarter of the way to the moon. And today there are more people in more places using worse drugs in worse ways than ever before. The number of Americans arrested for drug possession has tripled since 1980. Every 25 seconds somebody is arrested for drug possession in the US. In 2015, there are 1.3 million arrests. That's the equivalent of one in every 252 Americans. 20% of the prison population, or 456,000 individuals, are serving time on a drug charge. 
That costs the federal government $9.2 million every day, or $3.3 billion annually. Drug, that's just not gonna work. Feels like a, a, a failure, yeah. To be honest with you, I think there's other bigger battles to fight. War on poverty, how about that? Illegal or not, new drugs keep coming into fashion. In the 1990s, a whole new generation experiences their version of psychedelia. So how many letters does love have? The answer turns out to be 29. Methylene dioxymethamphetamine is a 29-letter word that's shortened to MDMA and is otherwise known as ecstasy. MDMA both encourages the release of serotonin, but also inhibits the uptake of serotonin. So people get really flooded by this feel-good neurotransmitter. It makes them want to dance and hug and it's like receiving the best news of your life when nothing really has happened. Known as the love drug, it is the fuel for rave and electronic dance music culture that starts in the 80s and is only getting bigger. It's not hard to see the allure of a pill that promises ecstasy, but MDMA's blast of bliss can put users in dangerous situations. A handful of MDMA deaths by dehydration set off a moral panic in Britain in the 1980s. There were some deaths because of it. What happened in the 1980s, especially in the UK, was that MDMA was being used at very early raves. And some of these clubs were turning off the taps in the bathroom and then selling cups of tap water for $15. There was no ventilation in the dance clubs. They were overheating on the MDMA and they weren't realizing it because they were having such a serotonin-based blissful experience. More recently, the psychedelic spotlight has returned to California. This time, it's not naked hippies or groovy Hell's Angels. It's the digital denizens of Silicon Valley who are hacking the technology of their own bodies by microdosing. Remember Albert Hoffman and what 250 micrograms did to him? Well, what if you took something smaller, much smaller, say 10 micrograms? What would happen then? Microdosing is taking very small amounts of LSD that will not produce the kinds of hallucinations that a larger dose would produce, but might produce a mood shift People are taking very minute doses, much less than you would take to get high, and using that instead of mood-stabilizing drugs. And considering how many bad side effects are associated with the current pharmacology around treating depression and anxiety, this may be a really great solution. Microdosing is like a sneaky, fancy way to use drugs at work, but like if you work at a startup, I feel like the company just gives you some on your first day. If it actually helps people, great. So yeah, I, I think it's worth worthy of study. After decades when it was impossible to study psychedelics legally, they're poised to follow the same path that cannabis took to legalization. First medical, then recreational, and now billions of dollars of investment is pouring into the psychedelic startup sector. In the last two decades, the number of people using LSD in the US has increased by over 200%. And you're more likely to be a user if you have a college degree, are single, divorced, or separated, and you're in your late 30s or 40s. The middle class is the new psychedelic generation. Sorry, hippies. 
In the USA, 17 states have legalized the recreational use of cannabis. 36 have legalized its use for medicinal purposes. One state has taken this a step further into the realm of the psychedelics. Just this last year, Oregon voted to openly allow the sale and distribution of psilocybin mushrooms. I hope to see for the future of psychedelics that there's more openness to researching their possible uses in humans. On the positive side, I see psychiatry embracing psychedelic therapy, but the money behind it is going to drive false claims about psychedelics. And you're going to see more and more that the medical industry is going to push psychedelics into places where they might not necessarily fit. I do think certain psychedelics will become legal, especially for medical reasons, but it is still illegal. I do not promote it. I do not encourage anybody to do it. Without doubt, a substance like ecstasy is ideal for couples therapy. It's ideal for post-traumatic stress. A substance like the tryptamines, mushrooms, uh, I, I can see being extremely valuable for palliative care, for hospice care, for end-of-life um, counseling. I think it's important to really understand that psychedelics is not a panacea for everything not a magic solution, and it's not for everybody. Hey kids, don't do drugs, but if you do do drugs, make sure you have snacks. Oh god, my parents are gonna watch this and be like, oh my god, my son is a drug addict. They need to do shrooms. I've uh, had some ideas that I've written down when I was on psychedelics and uh, they weren't so good. That's why I don't tend to mess with those kinds of things, because I'm like, a small amount of that can do irreparable damage. I just want to know that I can do basic arithmetic when I come back.